Hello, I'm extremely sorry not to be able to be in Belfast in person at the Science Festival. Unfortunately, it seems the disruptive effects of COVID persist. However, technology comes to our aid and I'm delighted to be able to deliver this video of my talk. So it is almost as good as me being there in person. The nature or nurture debate is a long running discussion over whether an individual's characteristics or traits are predetermined by nature, its own genetics, or are shaped by nurture, the environment and experiences it lives in and through. This has at times become quite a heated debate amongst psychologists, sociologists and philosophers, with even the existence of our own free will under question. But almost always it is, of course, a question of both nature and nurture. I am the height and weight I am because I am fortunate enough to have had a good level of nutrition throughout my life, but also due to my genetics. At six foot tall I was never destined to be a jockey. And so it is with many other traits, including physical traits, personality or temperament traits, and health traits or medical risks. The nature-nurture question is a really pertinent one for guide dogs. Training is clearly important, but could we train any dog to be a guide dog? And if not, why not? Is there something in the nature of some dogs that makes them better suited to being, and enjoy being, a guide dog? In this talk, we'll briefly touch on some canine history and take a tour from over the lifeline of our guide dogs before looking at some of the traits and characteristics we measure in order to try and improve our qualification rates. We'll then look at the balance of nature and nurture and how we can seek to improve these traits via both influences. The partnership between dogs and humans is really unique. They are our workmates and our companions. No other animal has such wide ranging domesticated roles, nor shares our homes and participates in our lives to such a degree. This is a very ancient partnership. Dogs are the oldest domesticated species. Genetic and archaeological research has shown that dogs were probably domesticated between about 20 and 30,000 years ago during the last ice age. This predates agriculture at a time we would recognise as the Paleolithic or Stone Age. By 3,000 years ago, there were distinct types of dogs based on differing roles and functions and looking very different to their wolf ancestor. By the first millennium BC, there are lots of different types of dogs depicted in art, such as the two examples here from the British Museum. From Egypt, a drinking cup in the shape of the head of a pursuit hound and the Jennings dog, a Roman statue of a mastiff type. This division into broad groups based on function continued for centuries, resulting in geographical variations. This was similar to the situation in livestock, where, for example, pig or sheep breeds with very similar functions tended to be named after the county of origin. However, the Victorian era saw a craze for dog showing, and many of these regional varieties became codified into distinct separate breeds. For example, the four breeds of setter here, from left to right, the Irish Red, the Gordon from Scotland, the Irish Red and White, and the English. Breeds now became seen as distinct entities, with closed stud books meaning there was restricted crossing between them, and they became defined by their appearance and behaviours as well as their ancestry. The Kennel Club now recognises over 200 such breeds, from the Afghan Hound to the Yorkshire Terrier. The first, albeit highly speculative, evidence of dogs being used to guide blind or partially sighted people is from a mural in a house in Herculaneum, preserved by the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. Similar depictions are found in Chinese scroll paintings from the 13th century. However, the guiding role of the dog, as opposed to it being more of a companion, is impossible to verify. Nevertheless, various literary descriptions of blind people and their dogs appear to demonstrate at least some recognised guiding role was established prior to the 20th century. One such reference may be found in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, where he writes of Scrooge that even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. The first recorded systematic training of dogs to guide for blind people was in 1916 for German ex-servicemen from the First World War, with training occurring at a number of schools across Germany. In the UK, in 1931, Muriel Crook and Rosamund Bond trained four dogs in Wallasey, Merseyside, again to support ex-servicemen who had lost their sight in the war. This operation continued and became the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, which is now known simply as Guide Dogs, in 1934. Guide dogs moved to our current home in Leamington Spa in England's West Midlands in 1941. Since then, 
Guide Dogs has continued to grow and has developed a notable public profile. You may well be familiar with Guide Dogs from our fundraising, and this is critical as the process of breeding and training guide dogs is long and complex and very expensive. We rely hugely on donations, but also on our volunteers who home our dogs while they are on their journey. There's a really good series of videos on the journey of a guide dog on our YouTube channel, which takes you through each stage in detail. We have about 350 breeding dogs who are all kept at home with volunteer breeding dog holders, just like a pet dog. When a female comes into season, she will come into the National Centre for vet checks and if all is well, will mate with one of our stud dogs. She then returns home and most of our guide dog mums whelp in the home with the support from our dedicated staff. So the puppies are born into a home environment and stay with mum until they are about seven weeks old. During this time, there is lots of hands-on support from our breeding dog advisors who visit regularly and monitor the puppies closely to ensure they are growing and developing well. A really important aspect here is good socialisation, which includes exploration of the home, interaction with people and visual, tactile and auditory stimulation. For example, exposure to TV and radio, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, all the stuff around the home. This exposure to stimuli impacts future behaviour not only when they encounter these things again, but also in general in making encountering new stimuli a positive rather than negative experience. This is all part of helping to influence traits via nurture and begins right after birth. At seven weeks old, the litter leaves their mum and all together travel into our national centre near Leamington Spa. Here they spend a week or so having vaccinations and antiparasite treatment, getting their microchips and having some assessments, as well as much more socialisation. Again, this is all influencing the nurture of our puppies, reducing the likelihood of disease and shaping their behaviours. Lots of people at Guide Dogs think working in puppy block is the best job in the world, and I think it would be hard to disagree. After a week or so, the puppies then travel to their puppy raiser. These are volunteers who home the puppies for their first year and put in a lot of work to ensure the dog is healthy, socialised, obedient and responsive. The basic requirements for what comes next, training. So again, the puppies are raised in a home environment, much like a pet dog. During this year, they receive gradual exposure to all sorts of situations, for example, transport, shops, etc. and some general obedience training. Again, this is all about influencing the nurture of the dog. A big part of data gathering here is the puppy behaviour questionnaire, which helps us to assess the progress of the puppies. You can see here a spider graph of the results for a particular dog showing nine behaviour categories in blue against the average in grey. So this dog is better than average for behaviours around unfamiliar stimuli, C, um, but lower than average for behaviours related to the caregiver, H. All being well, the dogs leave their puppy raisers and enter training at about 14 months old. This training is more intensive and specific, using a standardised approach and something called positive reinforcement. This is a system of rewarding desired actions and getting the dog to associate the action with a particular cue, such as a clicker. This advanced training includes recognition of verbal and directional cues involved in guiding, getting used to the equipment, such as harnesses, and being able to operate in unfamiliar scenarios and ignore distractions. Once again, the training and management are influencing the nurture of the growing dogs. Once the required standards have been met, the dog is matched with its future owner. This process can take some time as the blind or visually impaired person's mobility and lifestyle needs must be matched with the dog's capabilities. Variation is key. Every dog, just like every human, is unique. Once a match is found, the dog and human work together under the guidance of guide dog staff to get used to each other and the partnership is made. You may have noticed from the pictures so far that we use more than one but only a few breeds to become guide dogs. What is the reason we use some breeds but not others? If the attributes required to be a guide dog were entirely trainable or down to nurture then we could use any breed but they aren't. Some of them are due to nature or genetics. To take a really easy example, here is a guide dog at work. Most commonly for us, these are Labradors or Golden Retrievers, or a cross between them, as shown here. If I superimpose another quite popular breed in, you can perhaps see an immediate problem. 
The miniature dachshund is 4 to 7 inches tall at the withers or shoulder, and the Labrador is about 22 inches, over three times as tall. Even if we could make a harness for the mini dachshund, its relation to the guide dog user is completely different. The speed at which it walks would be too slow. No matter how much we alter the environment, the nurture of the mini dachshund, we would not expect it to grow legs as long as the Labrador. This is because its short legs are in its nature. They are genetically determined. Size is a really obvious example of the nature of particular breeds that might make them unsuitable to being a guide dog, but there are more. The differences between dog breeds are not only in physical appearance, but also in their temperament, which influences how they behave. Let's have a look at some examples of breed types that have specific temperaments that predispose them towards certain modern roles. The Malinois Belgian Shepherd and Dutch Herders are particularly loyal and have a high drive, making them well disposed to police work. Greyhounds have a high chase drive, but not a huge amount of stamina, ideal for short races. Spaniels, on the other hand, can run all day. They love to play and have great scenting abilities, making them ideal for detection work. Collies and sheepdogs have stamina and intelligence and appear to have an inbuilt tendency to herd things together. And terriers have an incredible focus, chase instinct and can like to dig. The name terrier comes from the Latin terra, meaning earth, implying that they were developed to hunt underground. So you can see that there is a substantial amount of variation between breeds in all sorts of traits, both physical and behavioural, that is due to nature or genetics. And so at Guide Dogs we have chosen breeds that tend to have the traits and characteristics that most closely align to the attributes we are looking for. These breeds are the Labrador, the Golden Retriever and to a lesser extent the German Shepherd. These breeds tend to be the right size and have the right mix of intelligence, willingness and trainability to enter Guide Dog training. Crucially, they are also less likely to become as distracted as perhaps some of the Hounds or Terriers which remember have that inbuilt focus and chase instinct or to have the restless energy of the Spaniels or Collies. Despite the general breed differences due to nature that I have described, there is also variation within our dogs. Some will be taller than others, for example. This variation means some of our dogs are more or less likely to become successful guide dogs. Some of this variation will be due to the environment, to nurture, but again, some will be due to genetics or nature. We collect data on a range of attributes to inform us of how each dog is developing, any health issues they have and their temperament. This data includes regular weight and body condition score. We want our dogs to be a healthy weight. Behaviour questionnaires over several time points, as we've already seen. All veterinary consultations and treatments, including the routine, such as parasite control. For example, here we have an x-ray of the hip joint, which is used to determine the risk of a disease called hip dysplasia and a picture of the back of the eye, the retina, to check for ocular health. We also gather information from the puppy raiser and guide dog support staff and training assessments. These can be used to adjust the management of each dog, its nurture. For example, we can change the diet if it is overweight, focus on a particular aspect of behaviour, treat a disorder and tailor the training. And these will help us improve the chances that a dog qualifies as a guide dog. Sadly, there will still be some that don't make the grade. These dogs are sometimes retrained in other roles, while others will be rehomed. However, this is a big cost to the organisation, and increasing the qualification rate helps us make the best use of donated funds. So we are constantly evaluating how we can try and improve. One way will be to improve the nurture, the socialisation and training we use. But can we improve the nature of some of these traits too? Just as we have chosen the breeds that due to nature most closely align to the attributes we need, can we change this nature further? For example, we might want to try and reduce the incidence of a particular disease that commonly affects one of our breeds by reducing the genetic risk. To do this, we need to focus on our breeding dogs. This is a very important role that I have neglected to mention so far. We must breed our own replacement breeding dogs, or else eventually we won't have any more puppies. There are additional traits we want to focus on in our breeding dogs, for example fertility. We want our males to have healthy sperm counts, and we want our guide dog mums to conceive easily and be really good mothers, nurturing their puppies in the nest. 
You might think that increasing litter size would be a quick win. This is an interesting question. You may have heard about our record-breaking litter of 16 puppies born in November 2021. These two pictures show all those pups. But there were so many that we had to foster some out to ensure that they all got the essential maternal care in the first few weeks that they needed. 16 was just too many for one mum. Ideally, we would like a consistent litter size, not too big, nor too small. So we have a lot of information on our breeding dogs, which is useful to decide which dogs to choose to breed from and which pairs to breed to each other. Some of it is due to nature and some due to nurture, but only the nature bit, the genetics, is inherited or passed to the next generation. The nurture or the environment is not inherited. This can present a bit of a problem. For example, here we will consider the journey from genetics to the trait expressed, in this case body weight. At the top here we have our genetic variation in our population, and each individual has a unique genetic makeup which helps to determine their body weight. This genetic makeup is determined at conception when the sperm fuses with the egg and an individual's genetics is fixed. From that moment on, while still an embryo, through birth and in the nest, and then as the individual grows, it is subject to all sorts of environmental influences on its body weight both positive and negative, but these are unique to each individual. Ultimately, when we weigh the adult dogs, we see variation in weights, some being too big and some being too small. If we were to choose breeding dogs based on ideal weight, we would select Dougal, Nasher and Muttley, and not Pluto, who is too big, or Snoopy, who is too small. But if we look at the genetics up at the top, we can see that actually Snoopy is nice and moderate, but that he has suffered from poor environment. Pluto also has decent genetics, but his environment has increased his body weight. Essentially, the ranking of dogs according to weight is different to their ranking according to their genetics. The environment has muddied the water. And this can be a bit of a problem because we don't know the genetics and traditionally would use the weight as a guide to it in order to select our breeding dogs. But as we've just seen, there is an inbuilt error, which means we wouldn't select the dogs with the best genetics, as we saw on the last slide. But importantly, genetics is shared by relatives who have common ancestors. Siblings have parents in common, cousins have grandparents in common, etc. And this is the cause of their resemblance. We know that particular traits often run in families, for example here, with closer relatives having a greater degree of resemblance as they share more of their genetics. And this is really useful. By recording the pedigree, which is essentially a big family tree, we can calculate the degree of relationship between all dogs on our database, current and historical, some 65,000 of them. And by using these relationships with the trait data and some clever maths, we can calculate the genetic merit of each dog, stripping out the effect of the environment. This makes our selections more accurate. These estimates of genetic merit are called estimated breeding values or EBVs. And at Guide Dogs, we currently calculate them for a number of traits to support our breeding program. These techniques were developed in livestock breeding and have driven huge improvements in food yields since World War II. One of the reasons they are so powerful is that you don't need a measure of the trait on an individual itself to be able to estimate its genetic merit because we can infer it from its relatives. This may sound highly implausible, but let's look at an example. Bulls don't give milk. It's important to understand this, but each bull can sire hundreds or thousands of daughter cows, meaning that they are a big driver of genetic improvement. If just the best 1% are used to produce the next generation, then we will see bigger changes than if we use the best 20%. So it is really important to identify the best bulls genetically but they don't produce milk, so what do we do? Well, we look at the average milk yield of their daughters. What these cows have in common is their father, but all they have in common with him is half their genetics. If we determine that daughters from one have a higher milk yield than daughters from another, then we can infer that this is down to his genetics. 
So by using pedigree information, we can calculate the genetic relationship between all our dogs. And this is the basis for calculating EBVs for important traits. We can also use information derived from pedigree to monitor the levels of genetic diversity in our breeding population. Some traits are entirely genetically determined, for example, coat colour. But this can still throw up some surprises. For example, two black Labradors can, and frequently do, have yellow puppies. This is because whether the coat is black or yellow is entirely controlled by just one gene, with two variants, one coding for yellow and the other coding for black. But the black variant is dominant and the yellow recessive, which means that dogs with one of each are black, like the parents here, and a dog has to have both copies yellow to have a yellow coat. Unfortunately, in dogs, there are a number of diseases that are inherited in the same way as yellow coat colour, meaning that from two healthy dogs, on average, one in four puppies will have the disease. Here, knowing what variants each dog carries is really valuable, as it allows us to mate only combinations that will not result in disease. This has been possible for the last couple of decades using DNA tests, but now with advances in DNA sequencing technologies, the amount of DNA data we can gather affordably is increasing rapidly. And this leads to further opportunities. By replacing the pedigree with DNA sequence, we have the actual genetic data. Relationships derived from pedigree are averages, all siblings will show as equally related to each other, whereas in reality some will be slightly more and some slightly less, depending on how the DNA is sliced and shuffled when sperm and eggs are produced. Knowing the sequence data breaks the constraints of pedigree, allowing consideration of dogs not connected to our population. Furthermore, we can begin to identify genes or regions that influence certain traits of interest and monitor the genetic diversity in much more detail. Guide Dogs are now actively researching how to move into the genomic era in our project called Born to Guide and make use of the sequence data on our dogs, which will further advance our breeding program. So thank you for your interest in my talk. I hope I've showed to you how nature and nurture are so important in the production of our wonderful guide dogs, but also how advances in genetics can help us to mould and shape the nature of our dogs in future. Thank you again.